I'm getting a promotion, but a promotion in the aviation industry is a bit different than just a handshake and yeah, you got promoted. What is a promotion for? What am I being promoted to? We're gonna cover that today. But first, let's fly to Windhoek. <laughs> It all began seven years ago in flight school. Picture perfect Vero Beach, Florida. Set the stage for some of the most amazing moments of my life. From learning takeoffs to my first landings to navigating the skies with visual flight rules. Every lesson felt like a new adventure. And let's not forget those breathtaking views of the coastline and the countless solo flights I did over beautiful Florida. Rostock Lager, Germany, the next stop on the list, where I dove into the world of IFR training. Instrument flying, navigation aids, this was where the real challenge began. But with each flight, I felt myself growing more confident, more skilled, ready to take on to the next challenge. To the big leagues. My first job at TUI, six years back now, flying the iconic Boeing 737. My gosh, was I excited and nervous for my first flight to Ibiza with 200 passengers. But it was one of the best feelings I ever had. Three years into flying the 737, I lost a job due to the pandemic and started a new one at Discover Airlines. My first long haul job. Now it's not only the big league, but also the big plane. And I was so impressed after doing my first walk around and seeing how massive the A330 actually is. Time flew by and here I am, 30 years old, flying the A330 to beautiful long haul leisure destinations. Now it's time for a new chapter. It's time to become a so-called CRP. But what is it? Well, let's fly to Windhoek first. I was the third pilot on this day because the CRP needed landing. We went from Charlie 14, that was our gate, via November all the way down, taxi via November 6, 8, 10, all the way down to runway 18. In Frankfurt, that is totally normal that they send us through the whole way of November because the inbound traffic landing on runway 25 center and 25 left. They then taxi, for example, via Lima 14, Lima 15, then via Lima to all the gate areas. That's how they manage that they uh, that aircrafts don't come in the way of each other. And then we took off runway 18 in the direction of south to Windhoek. It is now 10 o'clock. I'm tired, I think I'll say that in every video. And um, yeah, but I'm gonna take a nap now and then we're gonna get into my promotion, what it is all about and my first nap time because I have to think straight for that one. Well, that nap escalated quite quickly. It is one day later now. <laughs> I was so over now, we just went to dinner yesterday and I fall asleep quite fast. Um, CRP. What am I getting promoted to? Well, it's called CRP, Cruise Relief Pilot, or SFO, Senior First Officer, as other airlines name it. But what is a CRP or an SFO? 
Pretty simple, it is a first officer on steroids basically. But that means the CRP or the SFO can replace the captain, not replace it, but um, basically sit on the left side, so on the captain's seat during cruise flight when he or she is on break. CRPs or CM first officers often have a lot more flight experience because they, they've been on the, mu on the muster, yeah, on the muster, on the aircraft type for quite some time. That depends from airline to airline, but we're gonna come to that later. And a CRP plays a crucial role in aviation planning for an airline because a CRP extends the flight duty period for hours and hours. Little example here, if I'm flying in two cockpit constellation, that means captain and first officer for example, the max flight duty time of a flight departing at around 11 o'clock is 13 hours. Depends on your contract as well, but EASA is around 13 hours as far as I know. And if you add a cruise relief pilot to it or see a first offer, that means we can do breaks. We divide them by three, one hour after takeoff, one hour before landing, for example, and that extends our flight duty time to around 17 hours. And that's a huge benefit for airline because only then we can go on routes like Mauritius or Cancun, for example, where the flight time is already 11 hours. But if something like non-standard would happen where we wait for suitcases or anything, we would basically go over that time and wouldn't be allowed to fly with two pilots. They would have to call a standby CRP then, and that would take a lot of time. We don't want that. That's why they plan us with three pilots ahead. But most of the time, those 13 or 17 hours, they go down if you fly through the night. I'm not, I haven't got the, quite, uh, the exact numbers with you right now, but they go down quite a lot. And that means they have to plan three pilots, especially during night flights, long night flights, because otherwise it wouldn't just be possible. But how do you become a CRP? Well, first of all, it's an hours, flight hours, and a seniority thing. Airlines always have a seniority, somewhere at least. So hours are most of the time a thing you reach before you reach the seniority to become a CRP. For example, hours may vary from airline to airline from which point onwards you can become a CRP or SFO. In my airline, it was 500 hours at the beginning because it was just a new airline, we, we needed a lot of pilots, but now they ranked it up to 1,000. Some airlines have 2,000. That depends from airline to airline what the hour minimum is to become a CRP. But most of the time, like I said, seniority is the more restricting part, you can say. Basically, you reach the hours, but you probably won't have the seniority to that. I luckily got the seniority by now. I've been in the company for two and a half years now, which is quite cool. That is why I'm in the training to become a CRP right now. But I would still see myself as uh, as getting lucky there because I would say two and a half years isn't that long of a waiting period to become a CRP. In other airlines that can go up to eight, seven, eight, nine years even. So that really depends if you're really low on seniority, really high, that just depends on a lot of factors. You most of the time get the hours first before getting the seniority. Then another thing you have to have to get uh, to become a CRP is your ATPM. Most of us pilots in a younger age or when they just started out their flying career, they only have a CPL, IR, frozen ATPLA. And that basically is not enough to get your CRP rating, if you call it rating. And um, so it's really important to get your ATPL check prior getting uh, to become a CRP basically. My airline does it that way that they do it in the EPTs before the initial training to the CRP, I'm going to do my ATPL check because I haven't got one as well. I'm doing it now. It's basically just, I think, two more things in a normal SIM check, which you have twice a year, and then you've got your ATPL. And then you go ahead with your CRP training. Another thing you need is um, you're going to run through assessment process. That depends from airline to airline. It may be two days, interview, stuff like that, but that really varies from airline to airline. Some make a huge thing out of it, some maybe do it a bit easier, or not easier, but a bit more um, spec down, basically. But that really depends from airline to airline. You're probably gonna have a theoretical exam, maybe an interview, and um, yeah, that's about it, probably. And, but that's basically how you become a CRP on the way there. And if you run through that process positively, yeah, you're gonna go back to school, as it is quite often with being a pilot. You're gonna get checked your whole life, and you're gonna run through assessments your whole life probably until you're a captain and you're gonna stay at one airline then you're just gonna get checked but why is a CRP that important? I, I talked about it like two minutes ago but let's go a bit more deep into that but why is it so important to have a CRP? well it is 
pretty obvious, first of time, first of all, to extend the flight duty time, like I said, to even 17 hours. But that enables the cockpit to rotate through, because without the CIP, if you just have another FO, he isn't qualified to sit on the left hand seat, so on the captain's seat during cruise. CRPs or senior first officers are allowed to sit on the left captain's seat from 20,000 feet upwards, depends on what aircraft you fly, 40, 41, 42, 50,000 feet, downwards to 20,000 feet again. Basically like a second officer, but on the captain's seat. When you become a CRP, it's basically the last step before becoming a captain. And if you fly for an airline with long and short haul flights, the normal ruster, not ruster, but the, the, the normal chain looks a bit like FO short haul, FO long haul, SFO or CRP long haul, captain short haul. And that is why CRP is most of the time the last step before becoming a captain. And sitting on the left side during cruise flights, us FOs, we often do like, if we see something with pilot flying, we go like, we look to the left and we say, are you fine with that? And if you're a CRP or captain later on, definitely. And if you look to the left and say, are you fine with that? Well, there's nobody sitting, there's a window and that's not gonna answer you. So it is really good for a CRP to sit on the left side, get used to the decision-making process. For example, if you have to divert through weather or something, you do not call the captain due to weather. You have to find the decision-making process for yourself. And that is why it's really important to become a CRP and just get used to all that stuff doing from the left side without anybody sitting next to you. Obviously, you've got that first officer next to you who's got probably brilliant ideas as well. But I guess you know what I mean. So why I have a CIP, I would say extended flight duty times and uh, get him basically even more ready to become a captain later on at some point. But that's why we need a CRP. I guess the most important point is flight duty times, but nevertheless, um, there's a lot more that plays a role into it. But before we continue with the training, what we do during the training process to become a CRP, um, I've got six hours to go here. So I wanna go head to the pool now, get some vitamin D in and I would say, I'm gonna see you when we're flying back to Germany with all those training topics and a beautiful takeoff out of winter and a beautiful landing in Frankfurt. So definitely stay tuned. Let's go to the pool. Talking about CRPs, uh, mine just caught me. His name is Jonas, shout out to you, mate. And uh, if I wanna play a round of golf, and obviously I can't say no to golf. So that was it with the pool session. We're gonna head and play nine holes of golf next to the airport now. Let's go. Packing is completed, everyone. Whoa. Thunder. Yeah, the thunder. Well, I'm not, I'm not the singer type of guy. But packing is completed. I'm gonna head to the lobby now, brief everything. We got a captain change today. That means I'm flying home with another captain, but that happens from time to time, so no biggie there. I'm gonna head there now, meet him, and um, yeah. Then we're gonna fly home. Flight time will be nine hours, 47 minutes. Probably somewhere around there, plus minus five minutes. Weather. A bit of thunderstorms going out of Windhoek, but they should disappear till we off block. Other than that, some weather near the equator, but Frankfurt looks good. Low ceiling, broken 2000 and uh, light rain. Nothing special, normal April weather in Germany, I would say. Yeah, but um, let's keep talking about that. What does training for CRP SFO look like? Training starts with two to three days of ground training. The first day is most of the time the theoretical exam. 
They basically ask us questions about the technical side of the A330 as well as general O&A questions. The other two days are about leadership and decision making. That's basically the heart of the ground training. It's where we learn not just to fly but to lead, making critical decisions with confidence and knowing precisely when to get the captain out of his or her break and get him into the loop. Through exchange in the ground training we learn from the experience from one another. After the two days of ground training we go into the simulator. The simulator is divided up into two lessons four hours each lesson and we basically do everything from the left hand seat because as a CRP we sit in the captain seat. We fly unreliable airspeed, rapid depressurization, engine failure, engine fire, all those stuff you don't want in real life we train for it from the left hand seat. Then the journey continues in the line training under supervision. That's basically where we've got a trainer next to you again and you go through various line training topics. Again, how, how to choose for diversion airport, the unreliable airspeed topic, NUT HLA, contingency procedures, all that kind of stuff is put into the training of super, under supervision again. And when you did that, you basically fly a normal final line check. When you pass it, you're basically a CRP. No, not basically, you are a CRP at that point. And that rounds up CRP, Cruise Relief Pilot or SFO, Senior First Officer topic. I hope you learned something from it today and um, we're going to watch that landing at Frankfurt here now. I wish you a pleasant day, have a good one, see you in the next one and enjoy this landing. Minimum. Retard, 10. Spoilers. Everyone's green. Diesel. 